Hello and welcome everybody. We are here for our Community and Health and Wellness Night open discussion on March 27th. My name is uh, Samantha Upshaw and we have Dr. Jamie Lee here as well. And what we're going to be discussing tonight is revitalize and redefine healing, reinventing, and setting boundaries. So we have quite a few topics there, which we'll go over uh, in our healing topic tonight. We're going to talk about daylight, sleep tight, how springtime affects sleep and weight loss. And we also have our next element in there we'll be talking about as well around outside of sleep, which is setting boundaries. And that is going to be springing forward and not backwards, maintaining momentum in your weight loss journey. And uh, if we have a little time there towards the end, we'll also be talking about reinventing. So that's going to be nutrition bloom, food versus eating styles. So I'm just going to let the rest of our participants come on board. We already have quite a few in here already. And what I'm going to do is just put a few little questions out here to see if I can get them moving along. I'm gonna stop sharing here first. There we go. Wonderful. So um, what I'm actually going to do is ask you actually verbally uh, over here these questions as they come in as I'm not finding that button uh, immediately as I would like. Um, so I'm just wondering on a scale from one to 10, uh, one being poor sleep and 10 being your best sleep. How would you rate your current sleep right now? And if you can come down into the comments there uh, and share them out to the group and uh, we're just interested to see how you rate your sleep. And it'll be interesting also in other talks to kind of sleep, see why is it that you rate your sleep that way uh, as you get going. So please feel free to pop over in there in the comments to start sharing as we get going. So um, I'm not going to waste any time there while you guys are plugging in as we're on a tight little timeline here tonight. So we're first going to start about the daylight sleep tight. So as, as we all know, sleep is a very essential part of our health and wellness as we go. It plays a vital role in our physical health, mental health, and emotional well-being. It's during our sleep that our bodies itself repair and rejuvenate itself. So that's where we're in the healing section here and why I've chosen to put in sleep. This is allowing us to wake up and feel refreshed and energized for the day ahead. Now, we're currently right now here in spring. We've just noticed that we've had a daylight saving shift. There's all sorts of things that are happening within our sleep naturally in this, this time zone. Now, I'm wondering, Dr. Lee, is there anything that uh, you can kind of share with us out there how how you could explain how the springtime or even just different time zones throughout our year can affect our sleep? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it what you're boiling, what you're um talking about is sleep deficit really Samantha and sleep debt that we have and so if you look at um, just a uh, just step back and not just um you know daylight savings and where we spring forward and stuff like that um <clears throat> what happens from a, a health perspective economically as well as a result of this right so um our um, sleep debt is is massive and so you can define it you know in terms of economic terms and stuff like that they actually have data for that and it's in the the billions of uh, of dollars to be honest with you so <clears throat> Um, and, and so um, it, it's it's very important in, in 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 from a health perspective as well. And uh, you know, uh, you to answer your question in the beginning and to the poll question, how would I rate my sleep? You know, when I use my CPAP machine, it's about seven or eight, or even close to nine. Um, <clears throat> and uh, if I don't, it's like a five or a six, right? So so that's important. So I take sleep very seriously. Um, and so in terms of um, sleep itself, you know. Um, there's this movement of actually um, of abolishing the uh, daylight savings time phenomena. Not rest, not the entire world actually does this, right? So it was actually, I think, it ben, uh, Benjamin Franklin back in the day where he felt like you know we should maximize our time during the during the warm, nice weather so that we could increase our uh, increase the economic growth and stuff like that. That's how it really came about. But there, there's a few other science and things to do with it too as well. Um, but that was kind of uh, one of the um, <clears throat> thoughts um so it was actually um, um, ben franklin that that did that but when, when they talk about um daylight saving times and we, we do this every every year obviously and then you know in the fall you you fall back you gain an extra hour um and so what happens is that you know the the rate of health problems increase significantly for example 
Um, when daylight savings happened on Monday, the rate of um, heart attacks actually increased by 24 or 25 percent. That's a core. That's a lot of increase in heart attack. And, you know, and that's just one hour. Imagine you do chronic sleep deprivation of 30 minutes a day uh, for a week, for maybe two weeks. You know, if you stay up all night, like right now, I'm, I'm, I'm actually on call at, at the Guelph General Hospital for ICU. And so for the likelihood, I'm going to actually be on call, uh, be up all night. So it's a career choice. Obviously, we have a lot of people who have a lot of career choices and stuff like that that stay up all night. And we need these people and they they they, they run the world. But, you know, it, it takes a toll into our mortality, right? And so 24, that's just heart attacks, you know, and you can imagine the amount of um, of accidents that occur afterwards as well. And so if you are sleep deprived, you actually perform worse than someone who uh, who, who drinks alcohol and drive, alcohol, uh, uh, drink, drinking and driving. That's, it's remarkable. They've, they've actually done studies to to demonstrate that too as well, right? And, and so that's kind of just the extreme end, you know, the heart attacks, we're all kind of worried about that, right? So that's how much it increases, just one hour of sleep change, right? So it may be more than one hour because obviously for us, you know, we might still stay up a little later and stuff like that, right? Um, but if you um, have chronic sleep deprivation, what happens to the body, right? That, you know, like you said in the very beginning, it's meant to rejuvenate, it's meant to heal you, give you rest and digest. And if you don't have that, what happens to the body? Well, it's a chronic inflammation. And then that's kind of the theme for everything. You know, a lot of the diseases we think now that is related to chronic inflammation, even like actually coronary disease is actually starts off. We feel more now as, as, as inflammation that breaks the endothelium, which is the lining of the coronary arteries. And then that creates a cascade of inflammation, uh, sort of cascade of healing. And we, we form the plaques and the plaques kind of get hardened and then we get coronary disease, right? And, and so uh, we know that people with sleep deprivation or sleep apnea, the best patients to, to study it in, they actually have low-grade inflammation over time, right? And um, and that leads to a lot of conditions too as well. So as the, so low cortisol uh, level chronically, you know, what happens to your body? Well, you know, you, you, you have more inflammation, so your joints might hurt more, your back pain might hurt more, your muscles ache more, your metabolism changes as well. And so, you know, I, I did this kind of talk to some physicians not too long ago, and I was looking at studies about weight management and actually sleep. And so, and, and some of the studies were quite ridiculous in the sense that, well, they're looking at energy expenditure, right? Energy expenditure in the sense that when people sleep less, they expend more energy. So, well, that's true because you're you're more active. But the long-term side effects is massive for that, right? And so over time, what happens is your metabolism actually starts to go down to conserve energy because you're not able to regenerate yourself. What happens is you, over time, create more sleep debt. And the thing is that as you have more and more sleep debt, it changes your behavior, right? And we know how important behavior is in terms of weight management. And I, I see this a lot in my practice where people have severe sleep apnea, Sam, <clears throat> and you treat them. It's like for some people, it's like day and night when they have like, for example, sleep apnea rate of about 100, 120. And these people are dropping their oxygen levels to the 60s and 50s and be below the chart. And for example, Sam, if you were to hold your breath as long as you can, you can't dip below probably 94 per 95%. But we're seeing oxygen saturation levels below that. We're talking about, it, I see 70s almost every day. Like people, I'll drop people, how, how much people drop. I've seen people below 50. And, and and no wonder why we have an arrhythmia. That's why we a lot of people die in their sleep. You know, is it, it's probably because it triggered an arrhythmia, right? It's the hypoxia that drives the arrhythmia. Uh, and and a lot of times people don't know they have coronary disease, don't know they have all these diseases, right? Until something you know, catastrophic happens. Um, <clears throat> but um, what what happens is 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 these behavior they they they, they change. Um, and so what happens is like when we treat these individuals. Their wife is so happy because what the wife notices, the patient is less irritable, right? And, and so, you know, you 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 become a better individual. Your relationship is better, you know. Um, <clears throat> and so what happens is that you choose better foods too as well, right? Your food choices. And when you're tired, what happens? You want like refined food. And... I, you know, I, I trained in Newfoundland for, uh, for, for my residency and 
back in the day when I was training, there was no such thing as, is like, you know, 60 hour work weeks for residents and stuff like that. We were working 80, 90 hours. Right. So, um, and, and so we would do every four days, we'd be on call and call like that. <clears throat> And so my family, my, my, I was married at that time and my, my younger brother was living with me. They know when I actually would be post-call because I would rummage for like the chips and, and stuff. And that's my go-to really. Right. And, and so, you know, it's just a craving you need because you need energy. You want to stay up. It's daylight when you wake up, you know, after the night's work. And so your, your, your food choice changes. So, you know, as much as those study say that your energy expenditure is higher, that's totally true. You're staying up later. But the long-term consequences are major. And the other thing, Sam, is the cortisol levels. Cortisol chronically affects our muscle, the wasting of muscle. So you look at patients who are on prednisone. What happens to them, right? They gain fat in the wrong areas. I mean, these are massive doses. We're right? talking about you know lower doses and cortisol. But in 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 a spectrum of things, Sam, what happens is that. They, you, you build more central obesity too as well, right? Um, mm -hmm. your, your muscle starts to waste a little bit too as well, right? So all these things, if you stay up all night, you you, you know what I mean. You feel weak and you, your muscles feel like they're shrunken. You become more dehydrated too as well because you're you're up and about, you're typically. And when you stay up late, what happens is the more you stay up late, Right, you want to eat to give yourself energy because you're tired. There's a natural circadian rhythm and the circadian rhythm you're mentioning, but Sam follows daylight. Right. And so it is always harder during the day, sort of during the summer, spring, particularly on June, the June 23rd, the longest day. It's always harder because daylight goes to like around like almost 10 o'clock. Right. And I hate those days because I'm actually in bed around 9 30. Right. And so I have to like really block out my curtains and stuff like that to to actually get my sleep. Right. And so so that's kind of what happens to our body when we have sleep deprivation that that it's ongoing. So sleep is super important, you know. Not only that. There are hormones that get released only during sleep or peak during sleep. And one of the major hormones for men here, okay, is growth hormone. Growth hormones are the hormones that make us build muscle, give us strength and vitality too as well, right? And growth hormones actually get secreted um, the most between 10 and 2 p.m. Most of us are, you know, we're still up at like midnight, right? You know what I mean? Um, and so you lose out that peak pulse of growth hormone, you know, as a youngster, you know, teenagers, early 20s, even like your early 30s, <clears throat> you don't really care to me. You got a lot of growth hormone. But in your 40s and mid 40s, that starts to change, right? <clears throat> so you want to maximize that too as well. So that's so between 10 and 2 a.m., right? Yeah, 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. That's when you maximize yeah. your growth hormone, right? And, and you want to do that because, you know, what happens to us when we get older? We lose muscle mass, right? 1% per year, right? After the age of 30, I believe, or some of that. And, and so that that's kind of what happens so, so not only growth hormone, but other hormones get secreted too as well, um, based on everything. There's a really cool book. I, I can't remember the physician. And this is how ingrained your circadian rhythm is. Every, and, and they actually they actually found, <clears throat> we should do a, a, a seminar. I mean, I want to talk on, on circadian rhythm. It's really interesting. They found actually the protein um, and the gene that... That so they, they they found the gene that creates the protein for circadian rhythm that triggers circadian rhythm. Every single gene, so every single cell in your body has these genes. Every single cell in your body has its own circadian rhythm. And so if you eat late, what happens to your GI tract? It needs to rest. If you constantly eat and eat and eat, you're actually insulting the lining of the gut and so the gut never has a chance to heal so if you're eating before you go to bed it takes you six hours to eight hours before the food gets leaves your body right and so by that time we're almost up and then we get up we drink coffee we we have a snack we eat again so when does your 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 your, your digestive system have a chance to heal? No wonder there's a lot of GI issues that we have, right? Like, you know, the, the extreme case is GI cancer, you know, because, you know, GI cancers in general, basic, the way they start is that they have a DNA problem, a mismatch, you know, all these kind of, there's about seven or eight different type of or more uh, type of uh, DNA problems. And then when they start to replicate, you know, these, they, you know, they make a mistake into copying the genes and stuff like that, and that's how really it happens, right? And so, and so every 
organ and our body actually has its own circadian rhythm and we need to respect that right and so when you respect that then really you're allowing the body to heal itself a lot more um and so so in terms of like fixing circadian rhythm too as well how do we manage this i think that might be the next question you yeah know, i'm going to cover a few points on there absolutely on the, on that yeah. circadian rhythm element because there's a few things that we can definitely do but i want to kind of put a little key point in there that you were talking about the the evening aspect and, and the tiredness and then the pull for nutrition to mm -hmm. kind of reawaken us now mm -hmm. i just want all, all you guys to kind of check in at nighttime though with that 9 p.m. crave that we all seem to kind of hit, um, you know, in that evening is to ask yourself then, am I tired? You know, not just that I have to go and eat to wake myself up, but maybe go to bed. Uh, maybe, maybe head out there and, and tuck yourself into sleep so you can get that restful rejuvenation and not fighting with the battle of, of eating then feeling, you know, the pull, the drive, and then having the gut disruption afterwards. So, um, <laughs> I do want to kind of talk about the daylight hours and uh, during the springtime and the circadian rhythm itself, because we, we see a different set of, of the sun rising and then the sun falling. So we've got the extension mm -hmm. within there and it can influence the, the biology and our internal clock. So we see the shifting of light exposure. Mm -hmm. So those longer daylight hours mm -hmm. that ex we're exposed to, this increases and helps regulate the circadian rhythm by signaling our bodies that it's time to wake up and be alert. So, you know, exposing yourself to certain lights can actually help along the way. Now, melatonin production, um, exposure to natural light, especially in the morning can help suppress the production of melatonin. So this is a, a hormone that helps uh, regulate the sleep and wake cycles. So as a result, the bodies produce less melatonin during the day, promoting more wakefulness and more melatonin at night. That's facilitating more sleep on the onset and maintenance of that as we go as well. Um, sleep timing is something that we can work with as well around the circadian rhythm. So, you know, having a look at when you're going to sleep or what, what's happening within there. So we've got these longer hours, we may be waking up earlier or even staying up later into this. Um, so this shift can adjust the overall duration and the quality of sleep as you're going on, even just small adjustments, 30 minutes here or there can, you know, change the sleep quality. Um, adapting to the daylight savings and the transition um, and the clocks as they do shift, you know, something for next year um, to kind of think about because it it hit me hard. It always hits me mm -hmm. hard because I'm not a morning person. So when the clock goes the opposite way, um, I'm having to find those adjustments. But I'm planning for next time is making micro adjustments, you know, as the week actually starts prior to um, the, the daylight saving time changes is trying to find those five minute switches. Uh, to get into to find the perfect format whether it was a 30 minute or getting into the right sleep phase um while i'm here dr lee um just just very briefly how does daylight save can can daylight savings affect sleep disorders at all sorry can you repeat that i, I just had a, a, a yeah not a problem can daylight savings uh affect sleep disorders at all by any chance yeah, it, it can in, in a sense that, you know, um, what happens is that, you know, when we talk about sleep, uh, sleep disorders, so some, the, the most uh, common thing is actually a sleep disorder breathing, right? So, so breathing difficulties and stuff like that. And and the other thing is also insomnia, right? And so it can create insomnia too as well. Um, and so daytime somnolence as a result of that, right? So, um, <clears throat> so, so the way, the way it is, if you're um, tired, it affects your sleep stages a little bit too as well, right? So um, if you um, stayed up all night, so the best way is just think about extreme cases, okay? And so if you stayed up, um, you know, very late or have significant sleep deprivation, the body wants to 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 pay back that debt, the sleep debt, okay? And so it's, for example, um, we typically have about 60 to 90 minutes of um, REM sleep per day, per night, sorry, right? And so if you cut that short, so for example, tonight, if I have no sleep whatsoever, so my body will try to catch up that sleep the next day. So it wants to sleep more. Uh, it wants to have more REM sleep when I, when I go to sleep, but it doesn't, it doesn't double in the sense that, well, you know what, you missed one night. Well, you'll catch tonight and we'll give you more, more REM sleep, but that doesn't work that way. <clears throat> what it does is that it, it gives you, it, it catches up a little bit at a time. Right. So maybe 10, 15 percent. And so when you stay up all night, it really takes you about almost two weeks to actually catch up your entire 
uh, sleep debt that you've lost, right? And so that's what happens. And the other thing is that you go into different stages of sleep. So more, so more REM sleep, more deep sleep and different stages of sleep will actually affect your breathing as well differently. So <clears throat> typically when we do REM sleep, we have more sleep apnea because we lose more muscle tone in our upper airways and stuff that keep our airways open. And so then you might uh, have more respiratory breathing problems too as well, right? And the other thing, you know, the tumble insomnia, people have a hard time you know, um, um, especially if 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 they um, there's a phase delay in terms of uh, wake up, they 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 have a hard they, they stay up longer, right? And so they stay up longer in terms of the, in terms of the daylight savings time, and so uh, what happens is it takes them maybe one to two weeks to adjust their their schedule over time. So and then typically the way they adjust is it's is is because um, they get exhausted and they crash, you know, down the road. And, and they make up their, their their sleep and then they start to reset their circadian rhythm. <clears throat> it's just like jet lag, right? Traveling. It's just like jet lag. Yeah. And just trying to travel on through it. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are some of the, we talked about some of the physical changes that have happened. And there's also certain little chemical elements. So arrival of spring doesn't only just bring a, you know, disruption over a sleep schedules itself, but it sets off many other changes. So sometimes we can see an uh, increase of serotonin. So just wondering out there if we can get a hands up or, or a comment out there of, Who's actually feeling better over the spring? You know, uh, you know the moods, the vibrancy, as this increase of sunlight that we're getting can actually help increase our serotonin. You know, the the feel good neurotransmitter it plays a lot of role in regulating our mood, our appetite as well, and the sleep as we go. So these elevation during the spring can contribute to that those moods and and better control as we get going so it's interesting sometimes we, we feel a difference you know the winter blues kind of hold us down we know that you know it's cold for one here in Canada um, and we're not as as active or bundled up but the sunlight affects us there we also have the melatonin um, as well so these longer daylight hours in spring help suppress that secretion as mentioned before um, these melatonin levels typically decrease in the response to the light signaling our body that it's time to be awake and alert. Uh, we also see cortisol, which Dr. Lee had mentioned as well. So it's another chemical reaction within the body, which uh, he's already explained, so I won't go too uh, deep within there either, but it increases, it helps regulate, it's promoting healthy balance and support alertness as well as relaxation. So with this being in mind, we've talked, I've talked a lot about the exposure to sunlight and I wanna put a challenge out there to you folks. I want you to challenge yourselves where you can is to get up and watch that sunrise. Why not? You know, we're waking up a few minutes old earlier, you know, working on yourself at that time, getting a little serotonin, resetting the melatonin, getting the cortisol and waking up in a good set manner for yourself. Um, so I've got this little challenge. You'll notice it on our post Zoom email that you get. It's written down there for you. It's the sunrise challenge. And I want you to kind of feel out, you know, really mindfully think about your sleep and the patterns and the energy that you have through the day by waking up and watching it rise. Now, also on the effect of watching it fall. So there's a lot of reactions going on in the neuroscience part of the brain where the sun's coming in and hitting the cones and rods in the back of our eyes and allowing us um, to kind of get a lot of these uh, effects as we go. So Hormonal and neurotransmitter changes not only influence our sleep patterns, but they also impact our metabolic activity. So once again, we're a medical weight management program. We're a health and wellness. We want to be able to promote these small little cues that you can put in. Now, um, managing the sleep um, itself during these spring months, we want to maintain consistency with sleep schedule wherever possible. You know, as Dr. Lee said, one night of thrown off sleep, it could take several, several sleep sessions to get you back on track. It's never going to be just one. Um, we're going to try to expose yourself to that sunlight, as we've mentioned, limiting exposure to artificial light at night. So once again, our body is receptive to these light elements and the light effect will definitely disrupt some of this and we've talked about it quite a few times throughout as we get going uh throughout our webinars as well it's just one thing about blue light here sam yeah. is that you know we, we we have cell phones a lot and I'm, I'm guilty of this too don't get me wrong right <clears throat> but you know i'm always mindful of it 
um, is that uh, when you use blue light at night just before bed, it actually delays your peak melatonin rise, right, by 30 to uh, 60 minutes, right? And so um, there are some blue light filters, although they're actually not very good, to be honest. There, there's, there's been some studies that are not that, that effective in terms of filtering a blue light. Um, I know Samsung, my Samsung phone, it has to actually, after nine o'clock, it goes to a gray, black and white mode. And so that's a, that's a little better. Um, you know, so so going our phones and, and, you know, we have a lot of like computer screens and, and, and obviously like great TVs and stuff of that, that's emitting some degree of blue light too as well. And so we have a lot that goes against us to make us drowsy. And so one of the things is you got to recognize when you're drowsy, just like the same thing as you recognize when you're hungry versus you're craving something too as well, right? And so that's very important. Yeah, I read a study not too long ago that uh, they had trialed out individuals that actually slept with their cell phone beside them on their desk mm -hmm. and then outside of the room altogether. And there was mm -hmm. actually differences, even just with the phone sitting beside them. That's mm -hmm. so nothing to do with blue light. The phone's off. Mm -hmm. But just that cue knowing it's there because we're such mm -hmm. an immediate you know, click in and individuals nowadays that we feel that it's there, we could grab it. So it could be mm -hmm. another thing I'm thinking about bringing it outside the room. And I've told many patients over the time and given them cues around putting their phone onto black and white, you know, mm -hmm. putting onto the gray zone. Uh, mm -hmm. For one, that stops the doom scrolling. You're not mm -hmm. stimulated as much to scroll anymore. Mm -hmm. So really good tactics in there for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that relaxing bedtime routine is important. So setting the body in motion for sleep as mm -hmm. you're whether it be reading, uh, whether it be a bath or whether it's disconnecting from technology for at least an hour or so or more beyond that uh, for that best sleep. The cool, dark, quiet bedroom. So Dr. Lee talked about blackout when uh, blackout curtains. I was going to have a question out there. Who has blackout um curtains itself because it's important to have that darkness the same as viewing the lightness uh, during the day to help us you know be awake as we go mm -hmm. limit caffeine and stimulations um the time frame um midday um is probably the best time to stop drinking caffeine to help set that uh mm -hmm. stop it interfering with our sleep cycle the exercise we've got stress management stress management's a big one i think out of it all is is how do we unwind at night? A lot of the time it's that discomfort in the evening with the stress management itself or the boredom or the un not, you know, not knowing what to do with oneself. So keeping that in mind of, of looking at the triggers and cues around stress management for all aspect, being okay. patient, persistence is always key. Um, and then also, if you think you've got problems with your sleep, you know, don't just sit on it. It's very important, as Dr. Lee said, you know, it, we can, if we have disrupted sleep, we can end up with physical, chemical, mm -hmm. all these uh, negative concerns. So think about a mm -hmm. sleep assessment. Um, yeah, in the uh, Sam, that's, um, I'm just going to read the question here, Sam. Yeah. Um, and it says, what if you use your phone for meditation at night times? Um, and, and so, you know, uh, meditation is is excellent, to be honest with you. Um, you know, it can slow the brain waves down, trans allow you to help you transition to to um, to sleep as well. Um, it, it just depends, you know, you know, most meditation, you're listening to something or you're following someone's mantra or some, some of that. So I think it's totally fine um, as long as, you know, you're using it in the right setting. I'm not saying that phones are bad in itself and stuff. There's a lot of useful apps like music apps and uh, white noises or natural. Oh, sorry, Jamie. Um, we've just noticed that you've gone on mute there. Sorry. There we go. I think we're back. Sorry, I did. We didn't hear your last thirty seconds there. My oh, apologies. No, sorry, just because my I'm gonna call the hospital's calling me. Um, I I think you know the the phones have do have their usefulness because there's a lot of good apps out there for helping people relax and you know I'll talk about like white noises, nature sounds, and stuff like that too as well. So I think I think it's it's useful. I think it's just the way you use it if you're on it to scroll through. TikTok, this will get watch YouTube's or shorts and stuff like that. I think those um, those will definitely stimulate you and keep you up, and you know not only keep you up for a long, like, will keep you up for a long time too as well, right? And it's a very addictive behavior too as well. And this is the reason why it's thirty seconds for like shorts, right? Um, so having said that, so um, use it in the right context. Excellent. There's another question in here too. Odd question, but what about someone who cannot sleep in pure darkness, almost scared of pure darkness, trauma response from having 
Okay, uh, yep, uh, I'm gonna keep on talking to this. I drowned when I was younger, but need a little light to actually fall asleep. So is it the, the style of lights? So we've got white lights, we've got yellow lights, we've got right. different colored lights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. For yeah, you're, you're you're right, Sam. There, um, you know, obviously, um, you know, that's very important from a mental health perspective, and then that's okay to to do. We're not saying that you know um, that that you know just abolish all lights. I mean, that the ideal situation is that we know that the studies show that people who have you know sleep in in in, in a uh, complete dark room where they used to study them um to study circadian rhythm it's about actually 24 it's more than 24 hours actually our circadian is more than 24 hours but we have a 24 hour clock right and and, and so um it's okay you know it, it's it's remember like blackout curtains of darkness is one 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 thing to the big to all the solutions right so if you need a bit of light you need a bit of light but you know the yellow amber lights are better dim it to as much as possible uh, as you can you put a timer into some of these two as well that allow you to 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 um to turn it off after maybe two three hours or two hours because it, it will affect your quality of sleep i'm not saying it, it won't even if your eyes are shut and stuff like that and, and you don't see it it actually will penetrate through um and, and so those are the, the those are things that you can do to to help mitigate that but that's one part and like that thing sam was saying is the routine you know routine 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 is is key right like for some reason you know after 9 15 i'm tired you know it's my routine right I, 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 there's a certain motion i go through every night pretty much um and uh you know if, if you want to really correct your sleep schedule um, it's not the time they go to bed that's important it's the time you wake up it's the anchoring of your wake up time because what we do is we we create a sleep uh, inertia uh, to to help us correct uh, correct our sleep schedule. And so, if you want to, you know, go sleep earlier, wake up earlier for whatever reason, you only move it thirty minutes at a time every, you know, one or two weeks and stuff like that. And over time, you'll start to do that. If you go from like let's say nine o'clock to seven o'clock, it's not going to happen, right? You know, you're going to be super exhausted. Your body hasn't climatized. But what we do is that we move half an hour of time and this, this mild sleep deprivation over time will force you to go sleep earlier. And then it is not as harsh on your body. So if you want to correct your circadian rhythm, uh, it's anchoring your wake up time is the most important. And I just want to quickly talk about our, our first question that we had in there in regard to the meditation being on the phone. Um, some things I just want to share a tool that I found useful in my house. If anyone knows me, I'm not into IT. I, it's something that I'm working with and growing with as I go. But my house is decked out in Google. I don't have Siri. Uh, you know, we don't have Alexis, but we have Google. And uh, constantly, hello, Google, play my meditation list for me. My phone doesn't have to be near me, which is great. I don't have to worry about the screen. It's just using the tools for success to still get what you need. So Great questions there, folks. Thank you for jumping in and asking. Uh, we're going to move on to setting boundaries. So that's the spring forward, not backwards, and maintaining momentum in your weight loss um, as we get going. Um, so some of the key points in here, you know, we see at the very beginning of all our success uh, here at our patients that focus and motivation are quite high within the first few months, and then it tends to dwindle down. And, and I'm sure that everyone can kind of agree with anything that they pick up and go along. So, you know, in the face of these, these challenges is about looking at setting some boundaries uh, itself within there, but understanding of, of where these points come from. You know, that, that excitement and that focus was in there and that's all you, you kind of put the attention to as you go and it will slowly start to track and is to try and bring yourself back in as you go. Now, I'm, I'm gonna let Dr. Lee have his quick little talk here just in case you do have to step out and then I'm gonna continue on from there. Uh, is there anything you wanna put out to the group in regards to maintaining momentum and boundaries itself. Um, so let's actually, if we can kind of cue it towards maybe the, 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 the points that our patients feel as failure points or such as Easter around the corner, because we're going to have this feeling yeah. of boundaries there. Yeah. And it, you know, I mean, there's never a journey that is smooth for weight management. Right. And so, you know, everybody comes and joins our program, high motivation, high momentum. Right. And, and, and after three to four months, you know, 
um, <clears throat> what happens is the momentum and motivation goes down a little bit for, for a lot of people. And so there's there's a few ways to to think about it. You know, one is that you know if if I was to ask you at that point, you know, where you you've lost a bit of you know you lost your way, it's not really you lost motivation in terms of like wanting to lose weight. You know, you know, it's really our focus starts to change and shift a little bit, right? And so you know something happens or or uh, <clears throat> or an event comes uh, it's coming along. And then we shift our focus. And then so as this, we shift our focus, it feels like <clears throat> our motivation decreases over time. So, and one of the things way to bring back your focus, which will bring back your motivation, is going back to the values of why you started this. Why did you enter the weight program? Why did you engage in this behavior? Why, why, why? Always ask yourself that question because that will put you in the right path once again, right? <clears throat> And so, so to me, when people say, you know, I lose momentum, I lose motivation, it's not really that because I think they will always have it. It's just refocusing back into what they really were after. And that's one of the things that that I, I always recommend. Um, so what's the second part to your question, Sam? Um, no, I think that you you did answer it in there. And I think it it is absolutely correct. It, it is that that focus point as we go and is to visualize you know, it is embedding back into the, the values and the, and for the goals, you know, if your values aren't attached to your goals, it's very hard to accomplish them and keep them going. You know, goals can be goals and values can be values, but when they meet up together, that's when you have that powerhouse of success and that motivation, but the visualization technique. So these are the, the, the cognitive tools that kind of help you move along, but it helps you embody that self-discipline and that self-respect for yourself as, as, as you go. So we want to also, you know, maybe each morning you're waking up and visualizing yourself, embodying that self-discipline for that goal or for that value as you're moving on. But I think it's so important too is to set personal standards and the real around the real self care. You know, these personal standards, we have these boundaries, we have this self care moment. But really, what self care comes down to when it comes to these boundaries is setting the personal standard. You know, what behaviors or habits do I consider sometimes non negotiable? Which ones do I have some flexibilities and why? Why do I allow flexibilities within there? They belong in certain areas. You know, as we're coming up to Easter, you're going to have a choice as we sit there at, at the, the, the Easter supper table or if we're, you know, walking through the stores itself. We need to come up with that, that action. But, you know, maybe we will choose to have, you know, a glass of wine with dinner or maybe we'll choose to have a chocolate egg. But what is the, the standard that you set for it. And I think we have to continuously try and live for those standards as we go on through. I think that's one of the, the key points along with visual visualization, but the self-reflection piece, you know, back to self-reflection and journaling. And it's one of the big tools that we use here is, is that journaling aspect, but it's allowing you to reflect on the progress, the challenges. We don't like reflecting on challenges because it feels uncomfortable. So therefore sometimes we ignore them, but then we end up just in that loop again, just that the constant loop. So yep. openly looking at those challenges, mm -hmm. how in a kind manner for yourself, but also realizing that you've got some non-negotiable moments within there. Where is the standard that you're setting for yourself as you go? So the journal um, gives you a space to reframe your commitment to your boundaries and celebrate that through the log itself and seeing where those flexibilities do come in as you go on through. Sometimes we need the support. Sometimes we need the community. Community is a big key at, at keeping you moving. If you're in a household that you're the only one falling in line, then we're going to find it a little bit harder for you, you to continue on. So how do we bring the value pieces in there? They don't have to align mm -hmm. with you, but how do we use them as a value piece within as we go? So there's some of the, the cognitive tools that we can kind of look at um, as you're going on, right? It's it's, what's the comment? There's Easter and Passover. I definitely agree with that. You missed that. Yeah, yeah. So yes, exactly. There's many holidays actually going on yeah. just the past week yeah. as well yeah. uh, as we go along. My apologies. I'm talking about the excitement that I know that I'm I'm looking forward to. Well, I'm not looking. Yeah, I'm looking forward to managing um, some yeah. treats because I've yeah. set boundaries of what I'm going to have. Yeah. Um, to indulge, but I'm yeah. also going to set it that I need to make sure that my environment's clear. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be an environment. I am a, a trigger for what's sitting in front of me. If it's not there, 
It doesn't yeah. exist. Yeah. And here, here, here's a trick that, that, that I do a lot, you know, and, and I'm, I'm a question guy, right? You know, um, and, and, and here's a question of that the holidays are coming and stuff like that. Right. And so like, you know, the question is, you know, what's, what's, what's the true meaning behind these holidays? There, a lot of us get together through these holidays. So, so a lot of us, you know, have a, a strong family value, right? And so that's why we do all these things. And there is also, also a religious value too as well, obviously. So we're celebrating both of these things. Um, and, and then so, the, and then we have a personal value yourself, you know, your own health, right? So how do you make sense of all these things together in one setting like this, right? That kind of mash. And, and so the question comes is, if you ask yourself, how can I address the family value, my religious value, if you have it, and my personal health value, do you have you ever sat down to ask yourself that question before these holidays come up? I bet you didn't. And, 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 and that's why we can't navigate through it really well, because you didn't have a preemptive plan right intention you know um implement intention we call it um in, in terms of doing what we kind of set out so if you ask yourself that question starting tonight for this weekend and then you just come up with scenarios and, and, and like sam was saying the boundaries what you're willing to accept i will eat this but i will do this to compensate or i'll have one glass you are more apt to stick to that plan than just going into the holidays just winging it right um and so ask yourself the right questions and you will have the right answers and solutions absolutely absolutely so you know i'm going to kind of squeeze that in there so practice gratitude for your values this season you know, looking and, and gratitude can shift the focus from perceived shortcomings or or, or the, the plan uh, coming across us to helping you appreciate the strength and resiliency in your uh, your body itself and bolstering your self-esteem and self-worth. So, you know, let's let's put our gratitude to practice within our values this season. If you don't know how you're going to focus, that's right. Go back into the value system of what am I actually doing here? Why does this exist for me? And how can I embrace this uh, okay. itself um you know when it there's many many questions you know like the kids come up with at the moment like when it comes down to to easter for for my home is explaining to them it's not just the easter bunny you know like where did it come from where is the philosophies let's ask more questions let's let's know more about this to and stem of, of those values setting in there so um if there's any questions in there in regards to uh what we've talked about there please uh reach out. Um, now, just where we're at for time here, I'm going to uh, actually hand, hand it right over here, reinventing uh, Nutrition Bloom, you know, Nutrition Bloom, come on, we're in the spring. So I'm having fun with these names. I'm not sure if you've caught them at all. Uh, but but Dr. Lee, we, we've talked a lot about in the office here recently around yeah. food versus food choices versus eating styles. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, it's it's um, as 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 people dive deeper into health and wellness, you'll you'll notice this more. Um, you know, you, you can think about individual foods as much as you want, but you know the the combination of foods are very important too as well, right? And so people get stuck in the minutia of you know what's the healthiest food to eat. You know, you hear like almonds are healthy for you, and people eat like a handful of almonds, but that's like five hundred calories, right? That doesn't serve you in purpose, right? And so, um, you know, don't get me wrong, um, where the source of your food, you know the type of food you're eating is important but probably just as important more important is your eating style right what, what you gravitate to and you know as patients come through here they will learn that we like a certain like style of eating throughout right we don't just do okay you know for example you do burns and you do 700 calories and this is all you can eat right this is to give you a list we don't give you a lot of lists but we start to educate you on the styles of eating and so so typically in the beginning you eat a low carb high protein you can call it a keto and call it whatever you want but basically low carb high protein right we don't really have too much boundaries of that but if someone pushes me it's like Gee, oh, dr lee like what how much carbohydrates can i eat well I'll, I'll give you the data right it's 100 you know if you're doing a loose keto like 100 grams of carbohydrates versus 50 right and but but the reason why we do that is we know that from the studies and evidence that the low carb high protein tends to lose weight the fastest 
right? And part of that is water weight and fat. And you, if you're doing ketones, you burn more fat. And, and, and there's satiety component with the protein. And people like pro, most people like protein, right? And as you transition through, you're you know, you, you you might get bored of it after three, four months and stuff like that. So then you change eating style. So, but you don't like start to just introducing carbohydrates. You got to know what you're eating, right? And so you might move to more to a flexitarian, Mediterranean, Mediterranean uh, eating style. Um, but you should learn how to eat di different styles for different needs of your body, for different parts of your life, different seasons of your life, et cetera, that kind of stuff. So if you are a runner, you're doing a lot of energy, you want high carbohydrate food. What kind of carbohydrates? Here is when we talk about more the individual foods. So, you know, is it refined? Is it not refined? Is it complex carbohydrates and stuff like that too as well? So versus like, do I eat pasta or should I eat potatoes and, uh, or, and, or beans and lentils, right? You know, there is a hierarchy of all these things, right? And so, and so as much as you want to learn the indiv individual foods, and I think people know foods pretty good, what's good and what's bad for the most part, but the styles, they have a hard time switching styles and knowing what, what's good to mix and what's not good to mix with each other. In a muscle building one, <clears throat> then you want to eat maybe a little more high protein and with a little more carbohydrates. So you have the energy to work out. <laughs> yeah, we'll have some more time on because this is just a micro topic for uh, this webinar because our next webinar coming up is Spring Forward, Dismantling Weight Loss Myths and Maximizing Outdoor Adventure for Fitness. So we definitely have more room in there to start talking around you know, the, the food choice and, and the food groups is where we'll dive more into it. But I thought it was a great element just to kind of add into here uh, as, as we get going um, and to move on through. But it is the eating styles or something that is is the lifestyle itself versus the short term food changes as we get going. So I think it's something to, you know, if, if you've got questions in regards to food and eating styles, is to start prepping those questions and thinking about why you have those questions and where you're stuck and what's cueing that on. And we can definitely cover a little bit more coming up. Um, and I think the next one is April 24th uh, that we're going to be doing that webinar. Same, um, you know, same last Wednesday, same 6 p.m. at night uh, as we go along. So is there anything that here, Dr. Lee, that you wanted to wrap up with or is there any, uh, any of our people listening in here that wanted to wrap anything up? I do. One last point is how much, how many hours of sleep should you get? I mean, a lot of people ask me that. Um, what's the optimal hours? And so, and so th there are some longitudinal studies, you know, and, and there's a range between six and nine hours is the range. And there's a U-shaped curve of mortality with respect to your sleep. So you sleep too little, so less than six hours, you have a high mortality rate. If you sleep too, uh, sorry, too little, you have a high mortality rate. If you sleep too much, so more than nine hours, you have a little higher mortality rate, right? And so the sweet spot is between six and nine, and the mean is between seven and eight. And you know, one thing for people who are morning individuals who can say they can get away from five, will get away with five hours, five and a half hours of sleep, that's not really true. Even though they can get away with it, that doesn't mean that they can they can function optimally. And that's the key, function optimally, right? And so the studies show that those that uh, sleep five hours and you make them sleep six hours, they actually have better reaction time. So you, they function more optimally. So, so keep in mind the hours of sleep that you need to function optimally. There's something I don't know here. Um, mm -hmm. Do insurance companies ever ask around life insurance or things like that around shift working and because we know the stats here right now you're telling me yeah. that you know yeah. the longer you uh you know have this sleep deprivation yeah. it's a shorter life they 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 they, they actually don't uh, at least at least i've done it before myself yeah i haven't don't do that but but th there is uh, actual uh, actual science uh data that's, that shows that we we uh, people do shift work uh, do actually have a, a higher mortality yeah, there, there's reasons to advocate for the insurance while doing that, but there's a reason yeah. to at the same time because <laughs> we want to be uh, being covered afterwards. It would, be, it would be unethical, probably. That's why. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, but yeah, that, that was an interesting point, and I'm very happy I'm not doing night shifts uh, anymore. I got heart, heart palpitations. There was times driving myself home, as you said, that I felt like I was drunk. I got home, and I'm like, I don't remember the traffic lights. Mm -hmm. I don't remember this or that. And it equals to drunk driving, no different. And I'm not, you are under the influence when you're driving tired. So keep mm -hmm. that in mind. If there's any of those shift workers out there, um, 
you know, just be mindful uh, and careful uh, as you get along. So we appreciate all of you for joining us on our webinar tonight and we we'll look forward to seeing you uh, in office or in community if you're joining us, um, if you're going to come into our group at some point, but we'll see you uh, April 24th for dismantling weight loss myths. So that's a really big key here and uh, having some fun outdoors. Um, and some of the adventures there. So thank you very much uh, for the, there's another comment in there is a thank you. We appreciate you. We're here for you. So keep on bringing this on and have a great weekend and happy holidays, whatever you are celebrating once again. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see you around. Take care guys. Take care. Bye.